was cracking big dogs. That shit was tight. It's Q&A Monday. Welcome back to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE Fantasy Football. And it's Monday, so we're answering all your questions. You guys submit your questions. I choose some of my favorite ones, and I drop the big facts. If y'all enjoy these, make sure you hit that thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. Make sure you drop me a question on Discord for a chance to be featured on next week's episode. I got a whole lot of shit to do today, so I'm not trying to hold you on for too long. I'm ready to get into it. It's time to tuck our shirts in. Ooh, I see my nipples. It's time to stop yelling, and it's time to eat. All right, so as mentioned in the intro, if you want a chance to submit your question via Discord, you're going to have to sign up via Patreon. Yes, the Discord. We've made the executive decision to lock that shit down. We've got almost 3,000 members in there. So if you are not already in there, I'm sorry, that's on you. You had so much time to join. I would almost say too much. We almost have too many people in there, and y'all are fucking crazy in the Discord. So sign up on Patreon where you will get a whole lot of value, a whole lot of exclusive content from the Big Dogs team. Once you're in Discord, just send me a DM with your question for next week's video. Let's get to the first one. DJ D Ray. I have three quality elite cream of the crop questions. I really like how you started this off. I think you hooked me in with the elevator pitch right there. Three quality elite cream of the the word cream got me. You caught me in a weird time. The word cream caught my attention, and now it's part of the questions. You have three of them. Actually, you know, it's your lucky fucking day. We're going to answer all three of them for you, DJ D-Ray. So thank you for submitting this question. Number one, Preston Williams will be back week one in Miami this season. Devontae Parker didn't start going off until after the Williams injury. With both back, will Parker see a dip in production this year? Well, I think it's important that we first start off by telling the tale of what happened in 2019 with Devontae Parker with Preston Williams. So we want to look at the first nine weeks of the season with Preston on the field. Preston Williams is undrafted free agent, gets a ton of preseason hype. All the coaches are yelling about him. I'm trying to get a message to their general manager to tell everyone to stop yelling. You know, like, I don't care if it's about Preston Williams or if, if it's about your wife. Like, everyone just needs to calm down and stop yelling. It's Monday morning. But they love them. They wouldn't stop yelling about him. And then he starts to ball out in the preseason. And we're thinking, okay. Maybe it's coach speak. Maybe it's just preseason. Maybe it's just crazy hype that will die down. He's an undrafted free agent after all. But then the regular season happens and Preston Williams proves to us that he is very, very, very much legit. Just look at the raw numbers on the charts, man. The totals for the weeks one through nine, right? The first eight games they had a buy in week five. And in parentheses are the per game numbers. So Preston Williams outdid him in targets, outdid Parker in receptions, outdid him in yards. Parker scored more touchdowns, which led to a few more fantasy points. But overall, Preston Williams was more involved and was producing at a higher level than Devontae Parker was before his injury. If Preston Williams stays healthy and he continues that pace, right? It was the first half of the year he stayed healthy the first eight games. He's arguably putting up the best statistical season of any rookie wide receiver last year. And that is not to be taken lightly given the class of rookie wide receivers that we saw come in in 2019. Paced out to 16 games, he would have ranked first in both targets and receptions among rookies, fifth in yards, fifth in fantasy points, and sixth in overall touchdowns. We look at Devontae Parker. What happens once Williams goes down? You see on the left side is him with Williams on the field. The right side is with Williams on off the field and the numbers are just out of control he's literally averaging over 100 receiving yards per game over the last eight games he didn't have a single game over 75 receiving yards from weeks one through nine not a single one weeks 10 through 17 half of his games went over 110 yards and he had double digit targets in all but two of those games so for 2020 we got we got a few things at play here right one you're assuming that Preston Williams is back week one tore his ACL very serious injury obviously right it took place one of the first days of November so if we're looking at the timetable that's 10 months week one would be 10 months from when he tore his ACL now I almost always, always, always bet against or fade guys coming off of midseason ACL tears. We know the scientific timetable for ACL recoveries for any average athlete is 9 to 12 months. This is non-negotiable. This doesn't rest on the the, the opinion or the comments that y'all drop on YouTube. This is a fucking fact. This is a big fact, and this is science. However, one of the lessons I learned last year from my Cooper Cup is I think you can give a little bit of leeway to the younger players. Younger players tend to recover quicker. We do always want to draft players two years removed from ACL 
ACL tears rather than 10 months or 12 months because they're still recovering fully, both physically and mentally. But again, I will give the benefit of the doubt to these younger players. So as long as very positive reports continue to come out about Preston Williams and they're all saying he should be ready for week one, though they haven't been on the field working. So it's, you know, how the fuck does a beat reporter that's not at training camp know that he's on pace to, to come back for week one other than him just telling people. What I will say is the Dolphin situation in 2020, they add absolutely nothing to the weapons group. So it's very much likely as long as Preston Williams is going to be on the field, it's going to be a very very heavy target funnel in an offense that's going to be trailing a lot. They're going to need to pass the ball a lot, but it's going to be very focused on getting Preston Williams the ball and getting Devontae Parker the ball. The long story short is this, like, yes, absolutely. Preston Williams back on the field is going to hurt Parker's ceiling. But that doesn't mean that Parker is, isn't a good value. He finished last year as a wide receiver seven, and he's being drafted at the wide receiver 27 right now. So there's plenty of room within those 20 rankings for him to return value where you're getting. Him. And it's not like Devontae Parker produced this Ke Kelvin Benjamin type year. He did in the sense that he was forced into an alpha role and the volume was being funneled to him at a ridiculous rate, but he was very efficient on those targets. He wasn't like Kelvin Benjamin where he was terrible with the targets. He just happened to get the volume. Parker was really good. He was blowing up some of the best cornerbacks in the league. He was putting up numbers. Yards per reception were big. The touchdowns were great. Like the dude was rolling and showed us that he was a different player last year. So that gap between where he finished and where he's being drafted, there is tons of room for regression and tons of room for Williams to account for. I'm definitely okay buying Parker at that price in season long league around wide receiver 27. But I think Parker realistically probably settles around somewhere between what we saw first half and second half. I don't think he has wide receiver one in his range of outcomes, if I'm being honest, but I think it's very likely that he does finish the top 20 fantasy wide receiver, thus returning value for you where you're picking him as a wide receiver three. Question number two, Keyshawn Vaughn was nothing special coming into the draft. After landing in Tampa, he got blown to one of the top running backs. Rojo was a good back for Tampa when they gave him the rock and since being drafted has become a bigger and all around better back. Do you think this will be a 50-50 backfield like how it kind of was when Peyton Barber was there or will one of the backs take the majority of snaps? If so, which one are you leaning towards and why? Yeah, this is a this is a situation I haven't really touched on, and it's going to be one that's very relevant throughout the offseason. So thank you for asking. And already you're welcome for me answering. No, I'm just fucking around. But if you do, again, guys, if y'all find value in these videos, uh, it helps me a ton if you just hit the thumbs up button. If you're new here, you could subscribe as well. So YouTube's like, yo, you like what this guy learned at his internship in Enron. He's spitting the facts. So we're going to feed more people to his channel. I mean, listen, Keyshawn Vaughn, I wouldn't say he spiked. He definitely spiked up after the draft, but he was most people's RB6, I think, going into the draft. And then he landed in a pretty good spot. But the hype around Vaughn, once the NFL draft really happened, got so high that Rojo is actually, in my opinion, becoming one of the better value picks in like all of fantasy football right now. And this is coming from a dude who wanted nothing to do with Ronald Jones's rookie year and wanted nothing to do with him last year. So this is not like me biased trying to hype him up because I liked him last year or whatever. Ronald Jones right now is currently the running back 33 off the board. And this is per FFPC. So high stakes redraft leagues. Keyshawn Vaughn is running back 32. So Keyshawn Vaughn is going ahead of Ronald Jones right now. People are out here fucking wild and acting like Keyshawn Vaughn was picked where Clyde Edwards Hilaire was picked in the first round or something. But y'all need to understand a few things. One, Ronald Jones has two years of NFL experience already. One already in this offense. And he is younger than Keyshawn Vaughn. Ronald Jones is younger than Keyshawn Vaughn. And he played very well last year. He went over a thousand yards from scrimmage on just over 200 touches, 40 targets, 31 receptions, showed that he's got some gas in the receiving game. Something that we had not seen out of him in college, something that we were always worried about him uh, in the pro game. And he showed like over 10 yards per reception last year was fucking good. And again, man, he knows his Arians offense. And this offseason in particular has gone very much in Ronald Jones's favor, a little bit due to the fact that Peyton Barber is gone, obviously. So that timeshare is not going to be there anymore. But realistically, I mean, if we're being honest, the whole COVID thing works in Ronald Jones's favor. Tampa Bay just had multiple players test positive for, for COVID. So they are locked down for the next few weeks. No questions asked. There's no timetable for when these guys are going to get into the facility, back into the facility, running together and getting this offense together. So if you think the Bucks, led by Tom Brady, are going to trot out some rookie running back with no NFL experience, without a real offseason together that doesn't know the schemes or the playbooks yet over a guy like Ronald Jones who does, you're fucking high. I mean, it took Bruce Arians like the entire year, 2015, the entire rookie year of David Johnson to put David Johnson on the field over Andre Ellington and a 30-year-old Chris Johnson. Everything about fantasy football Twitter and us being super bored this offseason tells you to draft Keyshawn Vaughn, but everything in reality and everything based around common sense tells you that Ronald Jones is by far the better pick. Will it be a time split? I would I would imagine it's definitely going to be a time split in this backfield, but that that's the case for a lot of backfields. It's not like you're drafting Ronald Jones in the third round, expecting him to be the, you know, the guy. I think it'll be a back a backfield split. I think what will happen is 
Ronald Jones will take like 55 to 60% of the touches. Keyshawn Vaughn gets 25 to 30%. And then Dare will get, you know, 10 to 15%, the remaining, you know, give or take a few percentage points this way or that way. I don't think Rojo will play on third downs. I highly doubt that happens. But with Tom Brady at quarterback, like he dumps the ball off to the running backs frequently and it doesn't matter what down it is so i wouldn't be surprised if ronald jones gets another 40 to 45 targets on top of most of the rushing work in an offense that's going to be super efficient score a lot i really think ronald jones is 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 one of the better values at running back this year and i came around to this conclusion on rojo as i'm writing up the the draft guide the season-long draft guide which launches a week from wednesday i literally worked on it from about 7 a.m to 7 p.m yesterday 12 straight hours of writing the top sleepers and undervalued players article it is a fucking beast and i can't wait to get it out to you guys so rojo found his name on that list and uh there's a ton of good information in the draft guide y'all it's literally the number one resource y'all need for your fantasy football seasons if you have not yet signed up on monkey knife fight you'll get the draft guides for free monkeyknifefight.com use the promo code bdge when you sign up deposit 10 bucks you will get the rookie dynasty guide for free you will get the season long guide for free which drops a week from Wednesday and Dr. Morse's injury guide for free plus twenty dollars to play with on Monkey Knife Fight is the fucking deal of a lifetime, the deal of the steal of a goddamn lifetime. Monkeyknifefight.com, promo code BDGE. When you deposit 10 bucks, you'll get all of our rankings, half PPR, standard, full PPR. All these exclusive articles, our top sleepers, our top busts, our must draft players round by round, about a zillion different value props in there. It is beautiful and it launches next week. And I will probably not sleep until then because I will be working on it for the next 172 hours. Let's get back to the questions. Question number three god damn dr dj dj read what the fuck your name is we're almost done with you is lamar jackson a one-year wonder if not explain why he might be a one-year wonder he is due for regression and honestly is overrated anyone who's a fan of lamar and drafts him in the first two rounds should be exiled and stoned to death for such an atrocity this is like that uh that meme where that kid's like at the halftime of his high school football game and he's like i'm not gonna lie they had us in the first half when they make fun of the second half of the statement or whatever this was like a really fucking okay question until it got just absolutely irrational by the end of it so let's talk about lamar jackson is he a one-year wonder are you high did you watch lamar jackson play last year here's the thing here's 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 the here's the motherfucking thing i hate talking about regression i hate it more than anything in fantasy football because people who talk about regression only look at the most polarizing numbers on a player's box score they only see oh 36 passing touchdowns that has to regress if you're going to start doing regression for the best numbers, you also have to do progression for the worst numbers and factor that in. You can't just take one number you like or dislike, factor regression in there, and that's your entire analysis of a player's stats for the following year. It's fucking dumb. It's irresponsible. It's irrational. And worst of all, it makes me yell, and we never want that. Are his 36 passing touchdowns going to regress? Yes, because he threw a touchdown on 9% of his throws. That's not that, that ain't happening again. But why don't we talk about his rushing numbers? He scored seven rushing touchdowns on 176 attempts. What's to say that shouldn't be 10 rushing touchdowns or, or 13 rushing touchdowns? You look at guys like Cam Newton or Josh Allen last year had nine rushing touchdowns on 109 attempts. Cam's had season of 14 touchdowns, 10 touchdowns, eight rushing touchdowns on much fewer attempts than Lamar Jackson had last year. You look at Michael Vick's seasons or Robert Griffin the third seasons, all have had a much higher rushing touchdown rate than Lamar Jackson did last year. So, okay, let's bring the passing touchdown numbers down. Let's bring the rushing touchdown numbers up. Regression always seems to be biased. That's the point I'm getting at. The beautiful thing about Lamar Jackson is this. This offense, most running quarterbacks, mo most, mo I don't, I'd almost say that there's never been an offense that's actually built itself around the mobility of its quarterback. And if they have, it's been nowhere near what the Baltimore Ravens have done. They have they have bought in 1,000. If you can go above 1,000%, that's the percentage that they've bought into Lamar Jackson's play style. They are not forcing him to be a pocket passer. So the absurd rushing numbers are so far from fluky. They're going to be there year in and year out. And are we not going to talk about with regression the fact that he only played in 15 games with those numbers? Are we not going to talk about the fact that they blew some teams out so he didn't play in the second half of some games? Like, are we not, we're just not going to throw that in there either? Like, listen, I'm, I'm not in on, you know, first round Lamar Jackson or second round Lamar Jackson in one quarterback leagues, but the take on regression, I think at least for his like passing touchdown rate this year is a lazy ass take. He's going to run for a thousand yards again this season. And if you want to talk about regression, let's talk about positive regression in the passing volume, whether it's him playing the full 16 games whether it's him actually playing fully all of the 16 games not having to sit or not being benched or whatever or maybe just a small slight change in philosophy in him 
not passing just 401 times. Right? He could see his passing volume go up to 450 pass attempts, right? An extra 50 pass attempts and still be the single lowest quarterback in terms of pass attempts per game. Vegas hasn't pegged up 26 and a half passing touchdowns this year, which is a 10 touchdown dip, a nine or 10 touchdown dip. Guys, at the end of the day, that's 36 to 40 fantasy points, which is like two to two and a half fantasy points per game. You take away two to two and a half fantasy points per game last year from Lamar Jackson. And guess what? He's still five points per game better than the next quarterback. So assuming that happens and we don't add anything to his rushing touchdown total, his rushing yardage total, his passing yardage total, and he stays flat in all those positions, drops down to like 26 touchdowns. He's still the quarterback one there. I expect a much bigger year from Patrick Mahomes. So I think we'll see like the gap there even out a little bit. And I'm not going to be drafting Lamar Jackson in the second round, but but end of the third round in one quarterback leagues, I'm not against posting up Lamar Jackson and just having him run the table for you at your quarterback one. All right, Mr. DJ D Ray, we are we are done with you. Get out of my face. Mr. Irrelevant, QA from Monday is a multi layer question. What's your preferred league type? Dynasty keeper redraft. What's your favorite roster setting? Meaning one or two quarterbacks. How many running backs, wide receiver, tight end flex? Favorite scoring system? Four point or six point passing touchdown, standard, full PBR, half PBR, tight end premium, etc. What do you think? Auction style drafts are not very common or popular. Describe your ideal league. You're in one league, only one parameter. Blah, 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 blah. I'm so sorry if you have this podcast sped up at 1.5x because you probably didn't hear a word I said. And if you were listening at normal, you might honestly have had to slow that down. So basically, he's asking me my favorite league type. So let's start off with Dynasty Keeper Redraft. Uh, I would say Keeper is definitely my least favorite. I think it's just a, like a shitty medium between the two best. Dynasty is growing on me really, really quickly, especially this offseason where our audience and our channel have been getting really, really invested into Dynasty. The caveat with Dynasty is that you have to have really invested people in it, right? It's not like something that you could do for a year that's fun and then people drop out. It ruins the league really quickly. So if you have a good dynasty league, which you can be part of if you're in our discord, patreon.com slash BDGE, we have over, I think, 115 dynasty startups that we've started through discord, $50 buy-ins, $100 buy-ins. I think we started to do a premium prices of $250 buy-ins. So those leagues are really good. We've had nothing but really good feedback from those leagues. And those are all people within our big dogs audience. So one dynasty is really good if you get a good group. Redraft is starting to fall out of favor with a lot of people within like fantasy football Twitter. It's still by far and away the most popular for normal people. And I would say that's probably still my favorite type of league. That again, though, really like I would I wouldn't do redraft leagues with people that I don't know anymore. Like I wouldn't join like a Yahoo pro redraft league. Redraft is like is like more for like engagement. Redraft is like for your high school homies or your, like your college buddies or your work friends or something. It's like people that don't take it too seriously, but it's still like really, really fun. So I say redraft is my favorite as long as you can like do the draft in person and it's with people that are, are like super engaged in football, but not like too, too serious. So I, I like redraft right now, but dynasty is quickly creeping up. My favorite roster setting. I mean, if, if you followed me, we basically only do super flex content. So I think I think at minimum, you need to be doing super flex in basically all your leagues. If you're just in one quarterback leagues and regular tight end settings, there's only two positions that matter, running back and wide receiver. And I'd argue that like running backs are the only position that really win you leagues. So fantasy football is pretty fucking boring if you don't start doing super flex leagues. It also opens up the trade markets and stuff because a lot of players need quarterbacks and a lot of players have extra quarterbacks to move the pieces when players get hurt. So at a bare minimum, you need to be trying to move your league to a super flex, which means you're not necessarily starting two quarterbacks, but you have a flex position in which you can start a quarterback or wide receiver running back tight end and everyone starts a second quarterback there. So super flex for sure. In terms of how many, I would say ideally it's one quarterback, two running backs, two wide receivers, a tight end, two regular flexes, and then one super flex. I think the more competitive you want your league to be, the more flexes you should add into your starting lineup. That's probably it. I have nixed kickers from all of my leagues. I'm pretty much the commissioner in all the leagues I play in, and I've got kickers the fuck out of them. And that is the, one of the best moves that I've ever done in fantasy football. So if you're trying to improve your league, get kickers all the way out. I'm not really opposed to getting defenses out. I haven't played in a league with no defenses, except in Dynasty, we don't play any defenses or kickers. It's actually really, really nice not having to worry about that bullshit. Passing touchdowns. Uh, I play all my leagues are half PPR for sure. I'm starting to get on board with tight end premium. I think that's another way to get all the positions a little bit more valuable. Like I said, right now, the way fantasy football is kind of set up, it's like only running backs and wide receivers matter. I think we should start moving towards league settings universally where all the positions matter because it makes it more fun. It makes the player pools more fun and open and trades more open and just the drafts a lot more fun. You're getting more values in different places and you don't worry about anyone besides the top three tight ends right now and et cetera. So I'm a big fan of super flex. I'm a big fan of tight end premium as well. In terms of passing touchdowns, kind of like the idea of four point only because rushing quarterbacks have a premium in that compared to just guys who throw a lot of touchdowns. And I think like mobile quarterbacks in real life, that's a big part of their game. So it should be counted, accounted for in fantasy. 
So I would go four point over six point. I do like having high interception penalties though, minimum half. So if you're playing four points, interception has to be minus two. If you're playing six, minus three. I don't hate the combo of six point per passing touchdown, minus four point per interception. I do kind of sneaky like that. Why do you think auction style drafts are not very common or popular? I think that this is just one of those human things where people are scared of change. It's just like, you know, that's natural for humans, right? We don't like new things. And if you've been in a league with your buddies for like 10 years and you guys have been doing snake style of drafts, that's a, a major switch up. You would need to start an entire new league, I feel like, with 10 dudes or 12 dudes that are really committed to auction style. So I think the fact that redraft has just taken such a stranglehold on what fantasy football is and the changeover to auction style is so dramatic in the sense of how your league plays out. That's why I think it hasn't become more popular. I personally don't play in any auction leagues, but I'm not here to say like, oh, snake draft is the way I'm not here to like fucking pedal that the fact that they're worse or anything because most people who do auction leagues like, never go back. Auction leagues are the best kind of leagues available and I would never go back to a snake draft after doing them. So definitely not knocking them. I just don't personally do them. But I think the reason is because they're so infrequent that people are kind of nervous about changing. This is kind of piggybacking off that another league topic. Marillo GL. Hey, Nick, my question is, could dynasty leagues change settings in off season? For example, PPR to half PPR or roster settings. If so, how should it be done? Okay. So my initial take on this, anything with scoring, anything with like starting rosters is an absolute fucking no-go. You cannot change the scoring settings in the middle of a dynasty league. I don't care if it's just from half PPR to PPR, or half PPR to standard, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely cannot go from a one quarterback league to a super flex in the middle of a dynasty league. If you're going to do that, you have to start over an entire new league or start that league over and do a new draft over again, because that's just way too fucking dramatic. You want to add an extra flex spot? I think that's fine. You obviously have to have like a vote. I think if you're going to be changing something like that, have a unanimous vote. And if some people are against it, then you can't do it. Otherwise, you have to start the league over. You can't just change shit in the middle of the draft because that is just completely fucking unfair fair to people who have built their current team around the settings that you guys agreed to from the start. All right, we'll take a couple ignorant ass questions right now. John Conyers, when you're with a girl, should you shave your pubes bald or trim them to stubble? You never, ever, ever go full bald, Johnny. You make that mistake like once, maybe twice when you're like 16 years old and then you don't go bike. Listen, bro, it's 2020. People are more open. You can grow stubble. I, I haven't used a razor down there in over 10 years. This would be a fantastic time to plug Manscaped if our sponsorship contract was done. Unfortunately, it's not, but they're a great company. And I would suggest getting a, a buzzer that you could trim down to a one or a fucking half or whatever you want to do. But fucking shaving down there is really goddamn hard and not worth the fact that the girl's not going to care at the end of the day. Trust me, girls don't give a fuck. If, if a girl is into you enough to take your pants off and put her head down there, she ain't going to give a fuck that your hair is like that long. I promise. Go. Do not shave your pubes bald. Trim them shits to stubble. Codeine. Best leg workouts, in your opinion, without putting too much stress on the joints. So this is a good question. I like this question. I, as I've aged, your joints and shit take a lot of stress over the years, especially if you're someone who consistently works out. And I've consistently worked out since I was in, in college, I would say. So probably the better part of the last decade. And I think anything that's kind of not natural to your body is something that immediately starts to put stress on parts of your body that you don't want stress on. So anything that's really natural, natural leg movements, I think are the best type of exercise. And there, there are probably people in this audience right now that are physical trainers or really like study this shit. So y'all can drop your opinion or big facts down below in the comment section. That will be appreciated by young Codeine. My personal favorite leg exercise by far are lunges and variations of lunges. So lunges are just steps, right? Your body is completely used to doing lunges. And my favorite lunges are walking lunges. I would suggest not doing lunges where you just stay in place. One leg down, dip back up. One leg down, dip back up. I would do walking lunges. So find a space that's open, whether it's like a hallway in your house or at the gym, they got open spaces or some shit. I mean, you might start off with no weights. I, I would say like a lot of people jump into too much weight and that's also what fucks up their joints. Get lightweight, get like 10 pound dumbbells, five pound dumbbells if you need to start out with that. Do like six walking lunges that way. Turn around, do six bike and uh, you'll be sore as fuck. You, I'm telling you, if you haven't done lunges in a while, this is the absolute best way to start building muscle in like your quad and hamstring area and your ass especially. So lunges are fucking fantastic. Very natural to your body. Don't put a lot of stress on your knees, in my opinion. This is just my experience, y'all. I also love, I for, I'm not exactly sure what this exercise is called. I think it's called like the Bulgarian split lunge or squat. So you find an elevated platform probably around like, don't do that shit up to your waist, but like up to your knees. You might have to get creative with this one if you got nothing to put your leg on put one leg back on it like this. So the top of your, the top of your foot is on it like this. And then you're squatting on the other leg and you could do it with dumbbells too. You could hold up dumbbells like this or like that or whatever. Very, very light. Just go down with one leg 
do like eight reps and then switch off to the other one. So those are those are by far and away my two favorite leg exercises that I think don't put too much stress. I think once you start doing like leg press and stuff like that shit fucks up your knees. I think like even leg extensions, if you start doing them with too much weight, when you lock out your knees can really put a lot of stress on your joints. Just like food, man, the more natural it is, the better it's going to be for your body. The more natural the movements you do, the better it's going to be for your joints. The more you listen to me, the better it's going to be for your 2020 fantasy football season. That's all we got for today's Q&A. If you enjoyed, make sure you hit the button that looks like that right below. Go cop the draft guide, y'all. It's $10. It's the best way to support the brand right now. $10, go play a game of $2 on Monkey Knife Fight with the 10 bucks. They give you 20 bucks to play with because you get a 100% deposit match bonus. Once you play with $2 on the website, they'll email me and I'll email you access to the draft guide. So you're getting $20 to play with. You're getting the season long draft guide for free. You're getting the rookie dynasty guide for free. You're getting Dr. Morse's injury guide for free. Monkeyknifefight.com promo code BDGE when you deposit 10 bucks and your summer is set. If you don't want to listen to my ass for the next two and a half months, the draft guide's got all my best fucking content organized, curated, beautifully wrapped together for y'all. Drops one week from Wednesday. That's all I got for you today. I'll see you tomorrow.